All right, good morning, Regents class. We are, um, all I really need you to write down is the focus question at the top right here. I just want to start with this map, make sure we're on the same thing. Um, I would assume you already know what the Union States and Confederate States already are, consist considering we did the lessons yesterday. Of course, you can write it down. Um, I would definitely make mention of the border states because I want to just briefly talk about those. But again, it's not something you need to really write down. This is all stuff we've either done Friday or Monday. So I want to just take some time and go over that. All right. So the focus question is, why were many of the Union people upset about the draft during the Civil War? So we're going to take a look at um, how a military draft will kind of be needed. I want to talk about a couple of things from the start. Uh, what we're going to focus in on today is we're going to focus in on the first two years of the Civil War. All right, uh, we're going to narrow it down to those, and um, I like to consider the Civil War broken into two parts, uh, the first two years and the last two years. All right, you kind of break it down halfway. There's a huge difference in 1861 and 1862 from 1863 to 1865. There's a huge difference in the way the war is fought. There's a huge difference in how the battles go. There's a huge difference in the way the United States and the Union are perceived. So I want to really take our time and go over that. So please copy down why were many of the Union people upset about the draft during the Civil War. Uh, so we'll talk about some of these things here. All right. So in this dark blue color, we have the map of the uh, Civil War sides. We obviously have the northern states, which are the Union states. These are states that did not secede and did not have slavery. Um, you could see a bunch of them here. Uh, you also see some states out in the West. I would say California, Nevada, Oregon um, had very little impact in this war because they're so far away. Most of the war is fought between the Union here and the Confederacy, though these states do have a very limited part in this war. Uh, they are technically a part of the Union states. All right. Obviously in red, all the southern states here, these are Confederate states, states, states that seceded and had slavery. Uh, they had their own country. They had their own constitution, as you saw. Jefferson Davis was their president. They had their own generals. They had their own everything. All right, and they are located in red. What I would like to mention is for the first time, I would like to mention these border states. And I think just understanding that these five states existed is important for understanding the breakdown of the Civil War. So these are border states. These are states located on the border of the North and the South. Now, in these particular states, Missouri is right here. All right. You have um, Kentucky right here. You have West Virginia. You have Maryland and you have Delaware. All right. These five states are border states. They, even though they were on the Union side, they were allowed to keep slavery. So they had slaves. All right. But they did not secede. Therefore, they fought on the Union side. So this is also going to lead to the Union to be a lot more careful about coming strictly out against slavery because if they come strictly out against slavery, um, they will basically lose these five border states to the south. And some of these states, specifically Maryland, is pretty strong. Now, West Virginia is an interesting uh, thing. Uh, does anyone know in the chat what actually happens with West Virginia? They're an interesting uh, situation. Give everyone a 30 seconds to see if they know what happens with West Virginia. They're, they're a really interesting situation. 15 more seconds. This is not something I'm expecting really anyone to know. I'm just curious. It's like one of those advanced social studies things. Five seconds. Okay. So West Virginia was actually, someone raised their hands. Yes, go ahead. I have an idea, like it says West Virginia. So I'm guessing it was a part of Virginia, but Virginia was a slave state, but doesn't, isn't West Virginia a part of the state that doesn't, like was just a part of the union they didn't want us to see? Correct. Something like that. You're hundred percent correct. All right, well, I'm not hundred percent, but you pretty much have the right idea. West Virginia was a group of people from this area. They wanted to carve out Virginia, and they made their own state, all right? And that state, West Virginia, was going to keep slavery, but they were not going to secede. So Virginia used to be a lot bigger. It gets cut in like a third, and a third of the state now becomes what's known as West Virginia, and this happened because of the Civil War. All right? So um, this is just a breakdown, all right? Now we want to go into some notes and go into some details. So let's first start from yesterday. 
Okay, first start with yesterday. Well, actually, let's just do these two regions questions because we haven't done one in like two or three days. So which constitutional principle was the main focus of the North-South conflicts that led to the Civil War? Very rarely are they going to say, talk about slavery in terms of the conflict. So what is the main focus? That would be one, state rights. Okay, if you're talking to a Southerner, they're not going to say the focus of the Civil War has to do with slavery. They're going to say it is a state right issue and we don't want the federal government becoming too strong. Okay, early in his presidency, Lincoln declared that his primary goal as president was to what? Okay, excellent. Preserve the Union. All right, preserve the Union is another way to bring the country back together. Again, we talked about in the oversimplified video, if he could end slavery... If he cannot end slavery but bring the country back together, he would 100% do that. All right, so once the South secedes, his main goal is to preserve the Union and bring the country back together. All right, so let's first start with the with the first couple of days after the Civil War starts, okay, which we'll go into more. Um, so immediately after the Battle of Fort Sumter, which is a battle you guys focused in on yesterday, we did that one together on April 20th, 27, 1861. Lincoln's going to, for the first time in our country's history, going to suspend habeas corpus. All right, so let's talk about why this is important. Habeas corpus, for those that don't remember, I'll put it in the chat again. It is when a person is jailed, they need to be charged with a crime. But I can't be walking down the street and um, I get picked up by the police, and the police just hold me there without charging me with a crime. I can get up and just leave. All right. If they charge me with a crime, like um, you know, burglary or something, then obviously I'm not allowed to go anywhere. But if they don't have a crime and they're not going to charge me with a crime, then you can't be held anywhere. This has been a, a foundation of our constitution. Um, and if you look back, the wording in our constitution says this. Okay. Habeas corpus may be suspended when in times of rebellion or invasion. All right, well, the Union is not being invaded right now. The South is not trying to invade the North, but they are rebelling against the North, okay? Sometimes the Confederates are known as the rebels. All right, sometimes they're known as the rebels. So this is an act of rebellion. The Confederates have left the Union. They've left the United States. They've made their own country. They are rebelling against President Lincoln and the Union. So constitutionally, Lincoln is allowed to do this. All right. But a lot of people considered this to be one of the strongest moves ever by a president of the time because this is almost acting him acting like a king. He's taking away people's rights. All right. So even though he's constitutionally allowed to do this, people saw this as a very controversial thing. He starts getting labeled the word tyrant, which is a word we saw who also get mentioned as a tyrant back in this class. Who, uh, who else has been considered a tyrant um, a bunch in this class? Who else has been considered a tyrant in this class? Andrew Jackson, maybe, yes, you're on the right track, okay, because he expanded presidential power. But for sure, we want to go with Anisia, correct, King George, okay? King George is the prototypical person, if we think of as a tyrant, someone ruling with absolute authority and taking you and not considering the rights of people. So obviously, Abraham uh, Lincoln will be labeled that. Now, I want you to carve... Uh, Put that into your brain and kind of remember that because that's going to come up in a little bit of an interesting way about nine days from now after you take your unit two test. All right. But just kind of keep that in mind. He'd be labeled a tyrant from doing this. All right. So why does he suspend habeas corpus? Well, anyone that is a Southern sympathizer, anyone that is focused on uh, keeping slavery or being okay with the South leaving can be seen as a rebel or a threat. So anyone that is going against any military operations could be jailed. All right, so basically, Lincoln and his administration are allowed to now go around and uh, jail people that they deem to be threats to military operations or threats to be to the Union. Okay? 
Now, does he go around arresting a lot of people? No, but people do get arrested, all right? When Lincoln does this, he's expanding his presidential power and acting in his role as chief executive, okay? Remember, as one of the many hats of the president, the president has to enforce the laws. So the law says habeas corpus can be suspended when in times of rebellion, this is exactly a time of rebellion. So he's executing his constitutional law of the country, which has never previously been done before. He's the first president to ever suspend habeas corpus. He also may be the last president to suspend habeas corpus. There has been some governors that have suspended it, all right, at times, but I don't think a president has ever uh, has suspended it for the entire country. This further proves people's civil citizens' rights. You're not, they're not absolute at all times. You don't always have them. Okay, we've talked about this at length, and this is another example where sometimes your rights are not absolute. Okay, so in the beginning of the Civil War, um, the Union loses the first battle. Um, the Union suspends habeas corpus. All right, it's a very controversial and, and tough time. Now, in the chat, can you guys please mention, do you believe yesterday the Confederates did better in the, some of the early battles, or did the Union do better in some of the early battles? Were the Confederates better in some of the battles yesterday, or some of the Union better? Rosemary says the Confederates. Nisia says the Confederates. Mahin says the Confederates. Yes, for sure. The Confederates definitely do a lot better early on. They win three of the four first major battles, and moreover, they also um, will put into play a situation at the Battle of Shiloh where the Confederates kind of win early on. They think they win. It's not until a late surprise attack uh, where everything kind of changes. Okay, so the Confederates do a lot better early on. A huge focus of today is when we get to the oversimplified part two, we're going to look at why they do a lot better. Okay, and I think we've already kind of mentioned that. So the first two years of the war don't go so well for the Union, and Lincoln is not looked at in a very good way. Okay, I always say if Lincoln was to uh, stop being president in 1863, he'd go down as maybe the worst president in American history. All right. But obviously, the course of history changes a little bit, and we're going to start to see why. So let's first start with this. All right, do not write this down. This is a life lesson more than a uh, social studies lesson, okay? Especially to my boys in the class, you need to listen carefully, all right? We need to look at what a military draft is. Now, this is the first time um, I'm discussing this in this class. It will not be the last. But basically, the first couple of years of the Civil War don't go so well, so now we have to have a military draft, okay? So let's break down the difference between a draft and a volunteer. So every war that we have is going to obviously start with the volunteer soldiers, people that are already in the army or people that want to volunteer and join up in the army and fight in the war, okay? Every war has this, okay? Every war is going to have volunteer soldiers. Not every war is going to have a military draft, all right. When there are no longer enough soldiers that volunteer, there needs to be a law that does a military draft. A military draft is a law that could be passed that selects males, right now only males, age 18 to 25 to enter a war if soldiers are needed to fight. All right. So can a girl in 1860 join the military? No. Can a girl in 2020 join the military? Absolutely. Okay. They can volunteer. All right, they're allowed to volunteer, they're allowed to join, they're allowed to fight. There's no problem with that. But right now, only males, okay, can be eligible for a military draft. So if we get into a war that is, God forbid, very bad, and we need more and more soldiers because we don't have enough volunteer soldiers, okay, there can be a military draft, okay? So on everyone's 18th birthday, if you're a boy in this class, on your 18th birthday, you will sign up for a selective service registration form. It looks something like this in present day, okay? It's not very long, but basically you have to fill in your basic information and you're putting your name basically in case there is a military draft. You are required to do it if you are male when you turn 18, okay? If you are a lady, you do not have to do it at this point, but if you are male, okay, and you fill out and you turn 18, you can fill out, you have to fill out this form. All right. If there is a draft and a war is bad enough, 
if you don't go to the military and you've been drafted, you will be sent to jail, usually for five to 10 years if you what's called dodge the draft, okay? So this is more just an understanding of how things go. This is why I think it's very important to pay attention to current events. When I was more your age, there were some wars going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was always important for me as I got older to make sure I understood what was going on because I could very well be drafted if the wars got bad enough. I remember when everyone was through, thought, yeah, everyone thought World War III was going to happen. If World War III happened, then there'd be a military draft. Yes, that would be a very big situation, but I wish I had you guys last year because I'd be calming your nerves a little bit because I, I very much understood that World War III is not going to happen. Emanuela, is this in the Constitution? Great question. Is the military draft portion in the Constitution? I got to look it up. Honestly, I'm not sure. I know it's become a custom. It's become part of our unwritten constitution. Let me see. Give me a second, because this is important. Right to see. Okay, so basically it's in, it's implied. So basically Congress is able to raise and, and, and grow an army. So within that power of raising an army comes a military draft. So I would say, no, it's not directly said the draft is in the Constitution, but using the Elastic Clause, it could be interpreted that is in the Constitution. All right, that's a great question, Manuel, and I've actually never been asked that before. All right. So there have been only five wars where we had a military draft. Now, the Revolutionary War, which we didn't bring it up at that point because it wasn't a large draft and their volunteer soldiers were pretty big. The Civil War, World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War. Now, World War I and World War II drafts were very uncontroversial. Many people understood why they had to be drafted because those wars were so massive. The Civil War and Vietnam War come out a little bit differently. Do you still get drafted if you have medical problems like asthma? So I believe asthma you'll be able to, but there's some really weird rules. So like you won't be drafted if like you're over like six foot five. Um, there's some other medical conditions that can keep you out. Um, but what's complicated, guys, is what's very complicated is the rules and everything have kind of changed war from war, war to war. So if you're in the Civil War, you're going to learn for a reason. A lot of people could get out of the draft. During Vietnam, if they went to college, they can get out of the draft. But if there is a war in 2025, let's say, and you go to college, that's not enough reason for you to get taken out of war. So we'll go through each of the differences per each uh, uh, war, but let's just focus in on the Civil War. But every other war that we've had in this class, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, um, other ones you'll learn, like the Spanish-American War, you'll learn about the war in Afghanistan. We had enough volunteer soldiers, so obviously there's not a military draft. I would say 80% of the wars we've had, there's not a draft, okay? But the others, we obviously still do. Do you still go if you have poor eyesight? Liz Mel, yes, I believe you do. You just wear glasses. Absolutely, Aura. All right, so let's go on to this. This is the um, last slide for today before we get to the assignment. All right, so let's look at the Civil War draft riots. Okay. Most of the time, this only took place in NYC, but in some of my further studies, I believe it happened in other places around the country, like in Chicago, I believe they happened, okay? And I believe out in uh, Pittsburgh they happened, but the biggest ones were in New York City. So the draft gets put into place in 1863. So the first two years of the war don't go so well for the Union. They need to get more soldiers to help them. And why this is going to upset a lot of people is now people are not going to be volunteering to fight they're going to be forced to fight, all right? And a lot of people that were um, drafted, okay, a good amount of people, obviously New York City has a large population, are going to be drafted from New York City, okay? I don't know how the lottery works for the Civil War. I do know how it works for Vietnam, but basically just picture your name being brought into a hat and your name gets picked or not, all right? The Vietnam War was a little bit different. We'll talk about that. World War II is a little bit different. All right, so number one, many people are upset because they could be drafted for a war, which some people didn't believe. In. A lot of people that were drafted at the time were Irish immigrants. These are people that came from Ireland. These are people who never owned slaves. Many people from Ireland had nothing to do with the slavery issue. They did not 
really care much about it. But since they were living in the United States, now they were eligible for the draft, and many people of Irish descent were put in. And that led to them become, to become very angry and violent. And, you know, you guys know how riots work. Okay? Things get burned down. It's not a pretty thing. All right, so this upset a lot of people. There were many people, again, this is just the fact of the situation of the time. Many people maybe didn't want slavery, but maybe didn't want to go fight for a slave's freedom. Okay, and they could be convinced, yeah, no, it's more about preserving the union. You should be fighting for that, keeping our country together. But a lot of people saw past that and saw this as a war over slavery, and a lot of people didn't want to go fight over that. I mean, you could be very passionate, let's say, about uh, child abductions. You can be very passionate today about uh, police brutality, right? Are you willing to go risk your life to go fight in a war over that? Being passionate and risking your life to fight in a war, a lot of people aren't willing to do that. Now, a draft is forcing you to do that, okay? And many people weren't okay with that. Another huge issue was if you had $300 in your name, which was a lot of money at the time, trust me, but there was plenty of people that had $300. You could buy your way out of the war, okay? And that money would go to the war effort, okay, that $300. But this meant now a lot more poor people, such as immigrants, would now be fighting in this war and be drafted in this war. So basically, if you had more money, you were able to avoid the war, and that would uh, obviously leave a lot of people upset, all right? So if you just... I just said I said this already. If you just look honestly, the first two years of the war, Lincoln is not looked at in a great way. He suspended habeas corpus. The battles aren't going well. You have draft riots going across the streets. There's a military draft. He is one of the most unpopular presidents his first two years of presidency. Okay? So we're going to continue to look at his unpopularity and um, a huge reason why he had to kind of make some changes after 1863 because the first two years of the war do not go well. And we're going to see that now coming up. Uh, we're going to go now to oversimplified part two, I guess you can call it. Um, so I'm going to get to that right there. I can finish copying this down. You guys could open up the Google Doc. All right, while I set up this video. But for Link... He did want to preserve. He declared secession to be nothing but an illegitimate. All right. So if you're looking at the Google Doc, ladies and gentlemen, you'll notice a couple of things. At the top there, there are some practice questions, which I'm going to move to in a second. Okay, you guys could work on those on your own. That's just a little quick check, check in to see, make sure you guys are understanding and knowing what's going on. All right, so the questions, you know, it says circle or highlight. We're on the Google Doc right now, so I'll just share it. It says uh, circle or highlight the country return that best answers the question. So again, very basic stuff to start here. Just highlight, okay, circle. This is just a quick check-in uh, from the last uh, few lessons that we worked on with the Civil War, all right? Now we're going to look at more of the details of the battles, okay? So keep an eye on the chat. All right, we're going to first start with the Battle of Fort Sumter, and we're going to really look at the first two years of the war. So start with what was the Anaconda Plan. All right, number 11, get a sense of what's going on. We're we'll look at how this uh, uh, war starts to get going. All right, please uh, write in the chat if you have any questions. I'll mute myself, and we will start with uh, number 11, what was the Anaconda Plan. As they seceded, the Confederate states began seizing federal U.S. property throughout the South. Off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, was one such federal property, Fort Sumter, held by a measly, undersupplied U.S. force. The Confederate militia there demanded the fort surrender, a request which was quickly denied, and any remaining hope for a peaceful solution to the secession crisis probably then died when the Confederates did this. The Battle of Fort Sumter is considered to be the beginning of the American Civil War. Many of the Confederates there also considered it to be the end of the American Civil War. They hoped Old Abe would just sigh and say, okay, you win. Unfortunately for them, Lincoln actually said, you're about to get a roundhouse to the face. 
Lincoln sent out the call for 75,000 volunteers, and men signed up in droves, hopeful for some adventure and good old-fashioned F-U-N. In the new Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his cheekbones had also sent out the call for 100,000 men. As ever, both sides hope for a quick end to the war. Is it over yet? No, Jimmy, it's been one week. Is it over now? No! How about now? If you ask that one more time, I swear I will turn this army around and you'll all have to go back home to your wives and children. But in particular, the South knew the conflict would pose a bit of a challenge. How can we expect to win with a population of only 5 million against 22 million in the North? If you count us 4 million slaves, you'd have 9 million. Great idea. Hand these rifles out to all the men. Wait a minute. You almost had me there. The problem for Lincoln was that many of his top generals were getting old and were being a bit too cautious. The commanding general was a man named Winfield Scott, a veteran of the Mexican-American War, and by now, he was too fat to even mount a horse. Okay, chaps, we need to come up with a plan. Hit me. We could wait for the Confederates to come and apologize. Maybe we should all sit in a circle and discuss our feelings. Crossing the Delaware into New Jersey worked for me. Those are all terrible ideas. And you, wrong video. Hey, I'm the greatest president in the history of this nation. Yeah, we'll see about that, dingus. Eventually, Lincoln's generals came up with a multi-pronged strategy. First, a blockade would cut off and starve the south of supplies by sea. Secondly, taking control of the Great Mississippi River would sever the south's economic artery while splitting it in two. And finally, a main Union force in the east would move south and take the Confederate capital, ending the war. Bada boom, bada bing. Skirmishes began to break out across the nation and Okay, so let's break down the Union plan when the war starts. And the whole idea is, if you understand what an anaconda does, the okay, anaconda is a snake, a very large snake. Snakes, when they kill you, they try and bite you and impose venom into your body. An anaconda does it differently. An anaconda is going to squeeze the life out of you, basically give you an extremely tight hug, and that's the way they try and kill you. Okay, so the anaconda mm -hmm. plan was to put a naval... blockade around the south so they couldn't get any supplies from other countries which is a pretty good idea all right so you, you saw how an anaconda kind of looked okay it stops the south from getting any supplies there this was the north strategy this way they could focus on fighting them on the mainland though it does not get off to a good start Take a look at questions 12 and 13 coming up shortly after the ad. I know it's coming up at some point. And the Union Army in the east began to move south towards Richmond. Everything seemed to be going well until they reached Manassas, where they came upon a large Confederate force. It's almost like they were waiting for us. How did they know? As it turned out, spies in D.C. had sent a coded message to the Confederates warning of the invasion. Did you use NordVPN? What the heck is NordVPN? I'm so glad you asked supporting my channel, so thank you. Now where were we? Oh yeah, secession, fat man, and the Union invasion into Virginia. The two sides encountered each other at Manassas and both geared up for the first major battle of the Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run. The Confederates rapidly brought in support by a rail and the two sides were about equal in numbers. However, they were also equally inexperienced. A large number of civilians also rode out by carriage from DC to picnic on the nearby hills and watch the excitement unfold. Nobody seemed to quite understand how destructive this war was going to be. The Union forces pulled a flanking maneuver to hit the Confederates on their left and the two sides fired on each other in rows. Farm families living in the area were forced to flee the fighting, including a man named Wilmer McLean. Hurry up, Martha! There's a war out here! The more you tell me to hurry up, the slower I will go! The Union force saw initial success pushing the Confederates back to Henry Hill, but one as of yet fairly unknown General Thomas Jackson had arrived, and he took a defensive position, standing firm like a stone wall, holding the Union army off, and finally sending them running back to Washington, D.C. With heavy casualties, the sobering reality of war hit both sides hard, and the North, having just lost the first major battle, had to face the serious prospect that they may not actually win this war. President Lincoln, General Jackson whipped us so hard, the Confederates are calling him Stonewall Jackson. Wait, that's why they're calling him that? Not because he looks like he ran face first into a stone wall? Apparently not. Worse yet, the North had also lost the first major battle out West, giving away control of Southwest Missouri. 
All of this was terrible news for Abraham Lincoln, especially since many of his generals and cabinet already didn't have much respect for him. They felt he was incapable of running a war because he seemed a bit like your friendly old grandpa. He famously loved a long-winded story and a good pun. I've been so busy, my wife is missing me, but her aim is starting to improve. <laughs> but deep down, few realized he could also be incredibly shrewd. <laughs> oh, Abe, you're so funny. Funny how? Funny like I'm a clown? Uh. Babe, I was just... No, no. Funny how? Like I'm here to amuse you? During the war, Lincoln committed acts that were viewed by some as impeachable. His administration suppressed the free media from printing articles sympathetic towards the South. Some Southern sympathizers were even arrested without a trial. Lincoln's criticizers began accusing him of being a tyrant. But to quote the man himself, Hey, it's war, baby. What are you gonna do? By the end of 1861, with things already looking bad for the North, Abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass couldn't believe that the Union Army weren't enlisting black men. He continued to put pressure on Lincoln to make the war about emancipation. Mr. President, it's time to make the war about emancipation. Hmm, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. The feathers are already ruffled. But Lincoln, hanging on to hope for a quick end to the conflict, continued to fight only for the preservation of the Union. It was decided, however, that escaped slaves from the Confederacy could be held as enemy contraband, and many of these men were put to work bolstering the Union's infrastructure and supply lines. Hoping to get things moving, Lincoln made young General... Okay, so a couple things. Let's start with number 12, okay? Thomas Stonewall Jackson. He gets this nickname from the battle, the first battle of Bull Run. What may have been confusing yesterday is there's two battles of Bull Run. All right, the first Battle of Bull Run and the second Battle of Bull Run, both of which are very successful battles for the Confederacy. And for the first one, it has to do with Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Um, he had a little elevated advantage, okay, in the battle, and the Union tried to uh, basically overtake Henry's Hill, and he did not let it happen. And this was a huge loss for the Union early on in the, uh, the Civil War, and people started to realize, like, this is going to be a major, major conflict that's going to take a long time. Number 13, Frederick Douglass, again... Famous abolitionist, former slave. Um, now we're going to look at, he has the ear of Lincoln. Douglas wants to really do a couple of things, okay? For number one, for number 13, Douglas wants to have slaves, I should say that differently, have black people join the Union Army. And Lincoln's hesitant at first. That's... Lincoln's hesitant at first because he has the border states, okay? He doesn't want to ruffle their feathers. He doesn't want to get them upset. He doesn't want to lose them to Confederacy. And also, Frederick Douglass says, this war needs to be about slavery now, ending slavery. Again, he has the five border states on the Union. He doesn't want to lose Kentucky. He doesn't want to lose uh, Delaware, all right? He doesn't want more states to go to the South, so he's a little bit hesitant to do so, um, so that kind of becomes a problem. All right. Number 14, what Union general had the first major victories for the Union at the battles of Fort Henry and Shiloh? And then also number 15, we'll take a look at as well. Now, this is not the person for number 14, but General George McClellan is a real interesting figure throughout the Civil War. He's a Union general. His relationship with Lincoln is very interesting. George McClellan, the new commanding general, and McClellan began to train up his men. He thought a lot of himself, however, and believed he was going to be the nation's great savior. And like many others, he didn't approve of the president's handling of the war. On one occasion, Lincoln went to McClellan's house to meet with him, but McClellan was late returning home. He kept the president waiting, and when he finally got there, he just straight up went to bed. Now that's what I call disrespectful. McClellan talked the talk, but could he walk the walk? No. Like Lincoln's other generals, McClellan was maddeningly cautious. Hey man, could you move south and attack the enemy? What? Are you crazy? What if they have a big scary army down there? They probably do. What? Oh my gosh! McClellan worried that he did not have the numbers he needed to fight effectively. What if they have like 10,000 men? Okay, no problem. We'll get you 20,000 men. Well, what if they have 30,000 men? I'll need 40. Okay, you can have 40. Well, what if they have 50? I'll need 60. Lincoln tried, but it was all in vain. McClellan would not make a move for the rest of the year. The North's one saving grace for now was a general out west fighting in Kentucky and Tennessee. General Ulysses S. Grant, cool, collected, methodical, and a big fan of whiskey. His chief of staff took it upon himself to keep Grant sober. 
One officer said that Grant habitually wore an expression as though he were determined to drive his head through a brick wall and was about to do it. And that determination led him to score a number of key victories when others around him were failing. At the Battle of Fort Donaldson, Grant was like, why does Stonewall Jackson get a cool nickname and I don't? I want a cool nickname. Sir, the Confederates say they're ready to surrender and want to know your terms. No terms, just unconditional surrender. Hey, unconditional surrender Grant. That's a pretty cool nickname, right? Guys, right? Later in April 1862, the Confederates launched a sudden attack on Grant's army at Shiloh, but the determined, unconditional surrender Grant threw his lines at the rebels and sent them running. The battle resulted in the heaviest casualties in U.S. history so far. And despite his victory, Grant found himself under fire. You have to get rid of Grant. Why? Didn't he win? Yes, but he just threw his men at the enemy. Isn't that the point? Also, he's a loony drunk. Well, what does he like to drink? I believe whiskey, sir. Then send him more. Lincoln watched as his cabinet did nothing but bicker, and his generals did nothing. But then, worst of all, personal tragedy struck. Lincoln's young son, Willie, very much loved by the president, died of typhoid fever at the age of 11. Lincoln was a sensitive man and was heavily affected by the loss. His wife was inconsolable. But one of Lincoln's greatest traits, what made him such a great leader, was in the darkest of times, with composure and determination. He kept moving forward. He knew it was his responsibility to hold himself and his family together. And by doing so, he hoped to hold the nation together. And he had had it with McClellan's. Okay, so number 14 is Ulysses S. Grant. Now what you'll start to learn is Ulysses S. Grant turns out to be one of our best generals by far. He wins a couple of key battles early on, like the Battle of Shiloh. It's a huge reason for that success. And it's definitely someone that Lincoln needs to rely on throughout the war. But this is kind of just him getting started. Number 15, yes, Lincoln's son does pass away during the war, which is extremely, extremely sad. He dies from typhoid fever. Um, one interesting thing about Lincoln, and I think this was a huge reason why he ended up being one of our best presidents of all time, um, he had gone through a lot in his life. I know his uh, father died at an early age. His mother died when he was uh, relatively young, too. His first girlfriend, who he intended to marry when he was like 18 or 19, died. Uh, he had some family members. His sons passed away. Uh, he did not live an easy life. He, he went through a lot of tragedy, um, which makes sense for him to be our leader throughout the time of us uh, breaking apart as a country throughout our, one of our toughest times um, in the country. He ends up being a pretty good leader through it. And I think it's his personal tragedy that leads him to be one of the uh, better uh, presidents. All right. Um, take a look at number 16 and 17 coming up shortly. In action, Lincoln decided he was going to take control. In March 1862, Lincoln firmly ordered McClellan to once again move south towards Richmond. McClellan insisted instead they move by sea to the Virginia Peninsula and attack Richmond from the southeast. Yes, said Lincoln. Okay, anything. Lincoln held on to some of McClellan's men to defend D.C. from a nearby Stonewall Jackson wreaking havoc in the Shenandoah Valley, and he sent McClellan south. McClellan landed on the peninsula, and he began to move inland. He came up against a small Confederate army that had dug in at Yorktown. McClellan vastly outnumbered the force, but it's said that Confederate General Magruder deceived McClellan by cleverly maneuvering his smaller force and making McClellan believe he faced a huge army. No, you have way more men than them. Move forward. No. McClellan settled in for a month-long siege, giving time for Johnston to move south from Manassas and Magruder time to retreat. When he finally entered the city and found it deserted, he declared it a victory, calling his success brilliant. Then, after meeting some resistance at Williamsburg, McClellan moved to within just 20 miles of Richmond, his armies able to hear the church bells ringing in the enemy capital. You still outnumber them. Go give them hell. No. McClellan once again held back, moving slowly and defensively, and with his army split in two, the Confederates saw an opportunity to strike back. McClellan's advance was halted, and now the Confederates pulled an ace out of their sleeve. General Lee, you're up. Do you think we should evacuate Richmond? No, Mr. President, no need. General Robert E. Lee, one of the most brilliant military commanders of the time, was now in charge. One of his biggest strengths was his ability to read the mind of his enemy, and he knew McClellan was cautious and weak. After moving Stonewall Jackson south to join him, and even though he had a smaller army, Lee hit McClellan in a series of fast-paced, close combat battles that had McClellan spooked. McClellan retreated the Union Army back again and again and again, escaping the peninsula and returning to DC. 
Lee had defeated McClellan, and the campaign had failed. Well, that was a major success. A success? Tell me exactly what was successful about that. Well, we successfully retreated. You lost. I didn't lose. I merely failed to win. Things just kept looking worse for the North. At least their Navy had seen. Okay, so number 16 based off of the video. Yeah, George McClellan and Lincoln often did not get along very well. Uh, McClellan often defied Lincoln's orders. Um, I would also definitely say that McClellan didn't respect Lincoln, uh, didn't trust his military judgment, and this often led to a lot of problems between the two. Uh, so that's 16. Number 17 is the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. That is a name that we need to know and make sure we are very familiar with. He is unfortunately the best general in the war. It's not even close. Uh, Robert E. Lee was a former Mexican-American war general. He's highly respected. He was also the guy that was sent in to stop John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. Um, he is actually someone that's not really a fan of slavery, but he was very loyal to Virginia. And Virginia obviously seceded, so he became a part of the Confederate Army, which was not great for the Union because you'll see in a lot of these battles, he's going to be a huge um, person that uh, basically Robert E. Lee, uh, he's going to be able to knock out the Union in a lot of battles because he's just very smart, okay, especially when it comes to military strategy. Now, tomorrow we're going to focus in on uh, the next parts of battles, the next battles. Uh, yeah, Bliard, this is like the easiest lesson ever, so this should be easy 100 for everyone. This is going to be a little preview for both Wednesday and Thursday's lesson, so just watch, pre uh, look at question 18 and 19, just to become more familiar with some of these things, and then we'll speak briefly about what tomorrow's going to look like. In some success, capturing a number of key port cities, notably when they steamrolled past Confederate forts to take New Orleans. And speaking of the Navy, both sides have begun using ironclads. So that's pretty cool. But in the East, they still weren't having any luck. After McClellan's disastrous campaign, Lincoln briefly sent out one General John Pope to attack Northern Virginia. Hey man, just checking in. How's it going? Well, the Confederates kicked my butt at Cedar Mountain. Then they raided my camp and ran off with my money and clothes. Also, I appear to have been wedgied. Lee defeated Pope at yet another battle at Bull Run, in which nearby farm families once again got caught off in the fighting. Hurry up, Martha! There's another war out here! I'm waiting for my hair to dry! Wilmer McLean, sick of war, moved his family south, where he knew the war would definitely, absolutely, never touch him again. But Lincoln had yet another problem to contend with. European powers, in particular the UK, were looking increasingly like they may intervene diplomatically on the side of the Confederates. They were missing their precious supply of southern cotton because of the Union blockade, and they wanted to see a swift conclusion to the war. The tension between America and Great Britain had been increasing, especially after Confederate diplomats were discovered on a British ship. Now, after McClellan's failure to take Richmond, the UK declared it impossible for the North to win. Lincoln needed something to prevent Europe from getting involved, and after more petitioning from abolitionists, he decided maybe the time was finally right to make the war about ending the institution he hated, slavery. If the North had a noble cause to fight for, Europe would be less likely to intervene. But Lincoln and his cabinet knew before they could declare something as radical as emancipation, they needed a victory, especially now that the Confederates were about to go on the attack. Aware that he had a limited number of men and supplies, Lee now hoped that if he could just threaten Washington, D.C. militarily, he would gain Europe's recognition and crush Northern morale in time for the midterm elections, forcing the North to negotiate. With confidence at an all-time high, for the first time, Robert E. Lee invaded the North. But on September 13th, the North finally had some luck. Oh boy, it's my lucky day! A cigar in a field! Hey, what's this wrapped around it? Oh my gosh! That's right, the North had discovered General Lee's battle plans wrapped around some cigars. And in them, they saw that Lee had split up his forces. McClellan headed out from D.C., and the two sides met in the Battle of Antietam, a crucial battle that would decide the course of the war. It saw the most vicious fighting to date, and still remains the single bloodiest day in American history. But, for once, the North came out victorious, and Lee was forced to retreat. He's on the run. Chase him down and finish him off. No. You know what, old buddy, old pal? You're fired. The North had won their crucial victory. Lincoln breathed a huge sigh of relief, and with that win, he was prepared to take a huge step. On September 22nd, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. In January, all slaves held in the Confederate States would be, as far as the U.S. government was concerned, 
officially free. Throughout the North, free black men and women rejoiced, knowing that if the North were to win, their brothers and sisters would no longer be held in bondage. The proclamation also had the intended effect on Europe, who were not willing to oppose a pledge to end slavery. An outraged Confederacy knew that Lincoln had given the war a new meaning. It was no longer just about the preservation of the Union. Now, it was about creating a new Union, washed clean of its original sin. A Union without slavery. Okay, so number 18 is the Battle of Antietam. That is the first battle we are doing tomorrow. We will be doing part two of the battles, so you'll be doing the same thing on the worksheet. Battle of Antietam is the first battle you'll be working on. Um, you'll actually see the cigar in the field that had the battle plans on it. That's all a true story. That is known as the bloodiest day in American history. More people died on that one day than any other day in American history, so we'll talk about that more. And then number 19, the Emancipation Proclamation, which we'll look at Thursday, was a, uh, now to make it a war about ending slavery, not just preserving the Union. All right, so tomorrow's lesson will be very similar to what you did on Monday for the second period with the battles, same type of setup. We will have a little bit more of a focus on the biggest battle of the Civil War, which is known as the Battle of Gettysburg. So we'll have a little bit of a uh, understanding of that. But um, yeah, that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed. This is a very easy lesson to get 100 on, so please uh, send it in um, when you're all completed with the questions. Um, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day.